very good afternoon to you. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi bringing you the latest news right here on NTV. It is one o'clock. Thanks very much for joining us. Now, this afternoon, we will be live from the EACC, that is the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, also from Parliament with NTV's Silas Apollo and from the CBK headquarters, that's the Central Bank of Kenya, with NTV's Alex Mwangi. All that coming up in just a moment, but first, let's kick off from the EACC with NTV's Mel Miendo. And Kiambu Governor Ferdinand Waititu is back at the headquarters over the misuse of 588 million shillings from the county government coffers. Now, Waititu, who was arrested on May 23rd, but then released on the same day after he was granted anticipatory bail, is being grilled over irregular tendering procedures. Our reporter Mel Miendo is at the EACC. Mel, what can you tell us at this point? Sweetie, the governor, Kiambu Governor Ferdinand White, it was here at the EACC headquarters from 9.30 a.m. this morning. And he is still inside the offices. We've not seen him. When he was entering a bit earlier on, he was accompanied by two men. We believe that one of them could be his lawyers. But we do and are aware that he came in with two men. And so we know that they are being grilled by the EACC detectives. We've not yet been told just what is happening happening uh, some of the questions that they may be asking him but we are aware that it's about the 588 million shillings uh, from the county government coffers that was irregularly uh, procedure there was an irregular procedure with regards to the tendering process now it's not just the governor who's been roped in with regards to this scandal but his daughter as well you remember last week uh, we heard that some of the accounts where this money was been put in is belonging or rather belongs to his daughter so we do know that there's that question but when they came in she was not here so it's only the governor who is here at this point now smriti remember last week on the 23rd of may when the governor was being arrested it was quite dramatic he was put into a toyota high is car and when he was coming into the ESCC headquarters there's a lot of drama surrounding that but today he presented himself. He came in uh, very quietly uh, with the two men that were accompanying him and just came in, walked into the EACC offices. And now from that time till about now, maybe about four or five hours now, uh, he is still inside there. So we do hope that we'll be able to catch him when he will be leaving uh, the EACC offices. We've been talking to some of the people inside there and they're saying that the grilling session is quite interactive. Um, and so we hope to hear that we hope that we will hear from both the ESCC side and perhaps the governor himself. And Smriti, we've also been hearing governors saying that they want to be arrested in a good way, in a manner that does not demean them in any way. Um, and so I'm sure perhaps it's one of the things that the governor will be talking about today. He came by himself. Um, but remember, also Kenyans are saying that they too are Kenyans. And it is an issue with regards to corruption, then they should be arrested just like any other Kenyan would be. All right, Manuel, uh, an interesting point there because clearly not all Kenyans are arrested as they perhaps would wish to be. Anyway, thanks very much, uh, Mel Miendo, coming to us live there from the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. And no doubt we'll get the latest details as and when that story develops. Elsewhere, the National Assembly's Committee of Defence and Foreign Relations is currently grilling persons nominated for the positions of ambassador by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Now, those appearing before the committee include the EACC deputy CEO, that's Michael Mubea, who has been nominated to represent Kenya in Dublin, Ireland. Let's listen in. More and more, we are appointing our diplomats and we want them to go out there and fight for this country, to bake a bigger cake. And with this, I'm talking about economic diplomacy. Uh, you are being uh, posted to Zambia, whereas you have worked in uh, France, in London, in New York. Uh, what size of cake are you likely to begin for Kenya as you go to Zambia? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Madam Karugo, for your nomination. 
just two questions. The first one is that now you are going to be representing Kenya in Zambia. And as per your CV, it shows that you have been working from the year 1984 up to date. And you have been earning salary. When it comes to the report you have given about your income and your net worthiness, you are saying that uh, last year's alone you earned uh, and some earnings of two million nine hundred ninety-five and seven hundred five. Then uh, net worthiness, you go ahead to say that you are only four point two five eight million. Now, uh, if you reflect the two, one year alone. You are, you are about 3 million. And then, throughout your period, throughout your life, you show that you have only, you are, you are worth only 4 million. Does it uh, reflect to us that uh, you are very extravagant, that when you get your salary, you just spend it and you are left with very minimal? This is very important, taking into account that you are going to be the accounting officer and you'll be in charge. You'll be the executive and the account officer on our behalf in Zambia. And now, when you are an accounting officer, it means that you, are the, you, have, you have authority to incur expenditure. And if you are that extravagant on your own, will you not be extravagant with the taxpayer's money to the extent that we will be running at our own? Final question is, now, you are going to Zambia, and you have been there before. Zambia is a land world country, a very poor country compared with Kenya, even though it has minerals. And we have been hearing the, the stories of China and Zambia. The way Zambia has been placed into the hands of Chinese because of and failing to meet some obligations. What benefit can Kenya get from Zambia? All right, you've been listening in to the National Assembly's Committee of Defence and Foreign Relations that is currently vetting various individuals that have been nominated by President Uhuru Kenyatta to the position of ambassador. All right, now we can uh, take you to the Central Bank of Kenya headquarters and the Central Bank Governor has proposed the cancellation of licences for mobile money lenders who misuse customer information. Now, the governor cited the habit of these lenders of accessing customer private, uh, customers' private data and address books and then sending unsolicited messages. He was speaking at the periodic press briefing that is held a day after the Monetary Policy Committee's meeting. Coming up is NTV's Alex Mwangi, who is at the CBK headquarters. Alex. Thank you very much, Smriti. Yes, uh, this was a very lengthy press conference. It was just uh, nine minutes shy of two hours, and the CVK governor had a lot to say. And uh, when it comes to that issue of mobile lenders uh, sending messages to uh, unsolicited messages to contact numbers of uh, people who have defaulted, he said he would believe it if uh, that would have happened to him. It's not something that has pleased him at all. He says that uh, there are some some of those lenders who have not been uh, who have not been licensed, and uh, this is a space that uh, needs regulation. He also said that uh, he would like to have uh, some of them some of them just wiped out because they are those which are taking advantage of uh, the message, the information that they are getting from the public through the mobile phones, and uh, this is something that uh, the CBK seems keen to take up because it has been in the public domain for some time now, with uh, people being listed in the CRBs for defaulting. Uh, on the on the payment of their money but and then sometimes it happens that someone pays back the money but still they are not struck off the crb list this that is one of the issues that he talked at uh, at length here during uh, just at this very just right next to me at this very podium uh, in the central bank halls and uh, another issue that came up is the issue of uh, stawi which is a product that the central bank launched just about a week ago which has about five banks providing and uh, lending money to small and medium enterprises. The interesting thing about this uh, loan is that, that that is given to SMEs is that it's at a much reduced interest rate, even lower than what banks are charging. And uh, the other thing is that it is provided on the mobile platform. Now, the governor says that for them to launch Stawi, what they did was actually research around the world to see whether there's any 
other platform that they would have copied, but then he says that he has a lot of confidence that this product that they've launched is going to reach out to uh, the small and medium enterprises at the lower end of the spectrum in terms of affording loans. And he believes that these loans are going to help the economy grow, but much more importantly, he's also looking forward to a product that will even be a benchmark for other countries. One last thing that he spoke about that is uh, of significance is that uh, he talked about pending bills. This is something that is uh, in the retail sector. It comes from the retail sector where people are providing, for example, you, you are supplying goods to a company and then you provide the goods, but then you are not paid by the company, you are not paid by the county government, or you are not paid by the national government, despite a service having been provided. That is another issue that came up here. And he said that uh, this, is a, this is a significant problem that needs to be addressed because the main issue is that it, uh, it, it, it dampens the pace of uh, growth of uh, SME and it slows down economic performance because when this happens, it means that there's not the, the amount of money that is circulating in the economy is reduced. But beyond, but then you find that you've not been paid for services or uh, products that you've already provided. And yet these delays, sometimes they take up to three months, six months, or even one year. But those people who delay those payments are never brought to book. At times it's county governments, at times it's the national government. This is a matter of serious concern to the CBK and uh, it needs to be addressed. It is also being addressed by the Retail Trade Association, but it has also come into the radar of the CBK and uh, it's something that... Uh, will definitely keep you posted or keep the public posted on what is happening on that front in as far as the CBK is concerned now that it has taken up this uh, matter. So it was a lengthy press briefing, yes. Uh, there's so much more that he spoke about, but those are the major highlights of what he spoke about here at the CBK headquarters. I now take it back to you, Smriti. Alex Mwangi coming to us live there. Thanks very much indeed for that. Elsewhere, the High Court has rubbished the government's ban on all gambling-related adverts, terming the order made by the Betting Control and Licensing Board as one tainted with illegality, irrationality and procedural impropriety. Well, consequently, advertising agencies now carry on with gambling-related adverts. NTV's Seth Olale with the details. The High Court said the Betting Controls Board regulations and policy were adopted in a manner inconsistent with the Constitution and Statutory Instruments Act. The High Court also quashed the requirement that the Betting Control Board approves gambling advertisements before they are published and the requirement that advertisements warn of the consequence of gambling and its addictiveness. The High Court also issued an order against implementation of the ban on outdoor gambling advertisements and the requirement that advertisements warn of the consequence of gambling and its addictiveness. The Betting Control and Licensing Board had banned various forms of betting and gambling advertising. The directive included a ban on outdoor and social media adverts, restricted TV ads running from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., and endorsement of bets and their farms by celebrities. This has been quashed. In addition, the directive states any form of advertisement of gambling must be approved and such an advertisement must contain a warning message about the consequences of gambling, including its addictiveness, and must constitute a third of actual advertisement and be of the same font. This has been quashed. The new directive was enforced by the Betting Control and Licensing Board after Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi ordered the board to ensure that betting firms comply with the rules. The implementation of the ban has also been quashed. Let me not lie. Some of you will be out of this business soon. What are we raising our children to do? What kind of country are we building? Are we raising our children and telling them, just do nothing with your life, just go around betting and become a millionaire and live well? Is that the kind of thing that we are telling our country and our children? The Outdoor Advertising Association of Kenya protested the move and went before the High Court seeking the new directive to be revoked. In his ruling, Justice Mativo termed the directive as null and void on grounds that they are tainted with illegality, irrationality, unreasonableness and procedural impropriety. The ruling means that advertising agencies can carry advertising as they please unless there is a government appeal. Seth Olale, NTV. 
The Kenya Revenue Authority has shortlisted five candidates for the position of Commissioner General following the retirement of John Njiraini. Now, in a notice published in the dailies, KRA has picked the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya Chairman, that's Julius Waita Mwatu, former KPMG partner Richard Boro Ndungu, Andrew Kazora Okello, James Githi Mburu and Duncan Otieno Onduru. The five were picked from 30 applicants and KRA now wants the public to submit any information they may have on any of these candidates by Friday this week. But out of the 30 applicants, only two were women, neither of whom have been shortlisted. Okello and Onduru are formerly of KRA, while Mburu currently serves as the Commissioner for Intelligence and Strategic Operations. The chairperson of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development has said that the implementation of the competency-based curriculum will change the entire education system in the country for the benefit of the learners. While speaking at Magogoni Primary School in Kauma, that's in Kilifi County, Sarah Ruto maintained that the CBC will identify and enhance the skills of different students. When I look at um, why we changed, or why we are reforming our curriculum, it is based on many reasons. It is because the, the former education system was not working, if you like, in three main areas. The first area was that it was felt it had too much emphasis on content. Not that the content was wrong, but there was too much emphasis, so too much cramming. So you'd get people who know something but do not know how to do. Right now, the Court of Appeal will, on the 26th of September this year, make a judgment on whether a petition seeking Mombasa County to run the port will continue. A three judge bench comprising of Patrick Kiage, Mohamed Warsame, and Agnes Mugor was constituted to handle the appeal forwarded to the appellate court by three Mombasa residents. William Ramogi, Gerald Kitty, and Asha Omar had sought a declaration to have the county government of Mombasa be involved in governance, management, and decision making at the port. The three sued the Attorney General, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport and Infrastructure, the Kenya Ports Authority and also the Kenya Railways Corporation. Even assuming that at a time when this... Residents of Lavington here in Nairobi County are concerned about their health and sanitation after their taps started producing dirty water, with fears that it may have been mixed with the sewerage system. NTV's Mary Beffin reports. Black, murky and laced with soil, residents in Lavington woke up to the sight of dirty water running through their taps on Monday. Unable to perform basic chores such as cooking and cleaning, the residents were placed in a difficult position of what to do next. Sometimes in Akuja clean, tena inapotea inakuja chafu ile chafu mbaya zaidi wakati nilifungulia ilikuwa rangi black black ile eh, ile black kabisa kama ile tuseme kama ile ya sewage yenye inapitanga pande hiyo it was shocking this morning when uh, i came up i heard some st smell i ignored it i could not believe my eyes when i saw black water more or less black water there's no other color i can actually describe it with coming out of the Tap in the kitchen. One of the residents described the incident as a public health hazard. He says his timely payment of water bills to the Nairobi Water Company should assure him of clean water and thus action must be taken by the county government. The county government has dispatched its engineers to look into the matter. Mary Beffin, NTV. Women leaders from the Embrace group have expressed concern at the alarming rates of femicide and gender-based violence experienced among women here in the country. The leaders addressed the need for the justice system to issue graver sentences against perpetrators and the implementation of laws that will protect women against heinous crimes. The leaders will also hold a vigil this Thursday at the University of Nairobi at 4pm, which will be attended by Dr. Fred Matiangi. Today, if you go to a gender desk in the police, that is where the drunkard police, who is being punished, 
is sitting. So obviously, that shows that there is no seriousness in dealing with these cases if the gender desks, which were, had women officers who were trained, are no longer in existence. Um, I think we need to talk about this. These are lives of young women. And I'm so grateful that uh, the civil society, together with Nairobi County, together with all the members of parliament across uh, Kenya, uh, are coming together to say enough is enough. We don't want another life lost. The Public Service Commission has selected five members for the appointment of the chairperson and members of the National Land Commission. The five members, namely Kennedy Kihara, Esther Omlele, Mahura Namwenga, Stephen Odu and Priscilla Nyokabi will be in office for a single term of six years. Speaking during the launch of the selection panel, the chairman of the Public Service Commission, that Stephen Kirongo, urge them to consider the two-thirds gender rule as they undertake the procedure. For the appointment of the chairperson, for the appointment of the chairperson and members of the National Land Commission, do swear as a member of the selection panel for the appointment of the chairperson and members of the National Land Commission, do swear that Kenyans are looking upon you and I know the media will highlight who you are, and will be everyone in Kenya will be looking upon you to give them a team that in the next six years will make Kenyans proud. On behalf of my panelists, I want to call on Kenyans. Kenyans who are honest, because land is very sensitive, we want honest people. Kenyans who are able and Kenyans were willing to work to come forward. Elsewhere in the Daily Nation Children's Magazine, that's Junior Spot, has launched the registration of reading clubs in schools across the country to help boost literacy levels among primary school children. The clubs aim at making learning more entertaining and educational while providing learning materials to children. Registered schools will be provided with the Junior Spot magazine every week and there will also be lots of presents to be won. Junior Spot editor Miriam Miner said the program is tailor-made to support the new curriculum by making learning more creative and enjoyable to learners. The launch took place at Ida Star Academy in Kitale. We are targeting to get to try and get on board as many schools as possible at the county level so that over the holidays now that tuition was banned, we can have fun activities for them that are also educative. For example, we can have uh, uh, competitions, spelling bee competitions, story festivals at the county level. We'll do our level best and encourage others to join the club. We'll ensure that our children have the culture of reading. And if possible, in any competition, they will be there to compete with any other school which will join the club. Friends and family gathered at the All Saints Cathedral in Nairobi on Monday to mourn Mze Tobiko Ole Paloshe, the father of Environment Cabinet Secretary Keriako Tobiko, who died on the 15th of May, aged 96. Tobiko was remembered as a strict father, expected perhaps of a Maasai man. He was also eulogized as a humble, hardworking man who cherished education and shunned ethnic practices that were detrimental to the girl child's development. Tobiko had been diagnosed with advanced colon cancer back in 2002, but rigorous chemotherapy kept him alive. He eventually succumbed to kidney and heart-related conditions. May he rest in peace. Further afield, the death toll from a boat disaster in western DR Congo at the weekend rose to 32 while scores <laughs>
feet at the seventh edition of the Okpepe International 10 Kilometers Road Race. Chaprot, who won the Okpepe Race men's title in 2016 and also was first runner up last year, chasing after the leader Kipkemoi instead of crossing the finish line first. Chaprot stopped to help his Kenyan friend to cross the line first after he collapsed and held him until the medical team arrived at the finish line. Chaprot may not have fulfilled his ambition of becoming the first athlete to win two Okpepe titles since 2013 when the races began, but his deeds made him a hero who won the hearts of many.